came to the States when I was uh, 16, and uh, my father was my father was an entrepreneur. He uh, left a, a cushy job and opened his own law office, and uh, and uh, that's where probably the entrepreneurial blood came in the family. Uh, my brother, who is here, got the most entrepreneurial blood. My brother Tony. Uh, He's the maverick of the family. Okay. Is but that when you jumped in to the seed round? Yeah. So you're super yeah. early stage. <laughs> you're dealing with. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we at one point I also did the investment platform for a company called Net Capital in in, in Boston. Um, Net Capital is, is the company that was left over from Napster. If you remember, yeah, Napster. Of course. So you got a lot of free music um, off there. Exactly. Exactly. So John John came from from Napster. Um, was uh, is still is the eccentric founder of, of Net Capital, and he wanted to kind of establish a fund and a, a really early stage fund, uh, okay, like a project idea based fund, and take it into something bigger. Uh, he wanted to grow it into 150 to 100 million dollar enterprise, uh, which is really hard to do for a matter of really early stage. Really early stages are very, very. Early. Idea is still on paper. You're talking exactly. about pretty much. Exactly. Exactly. I mean, your seed round. Yeah. I mean, he had he had the he had the uh, both the geography working for him and a lot of the people that that he worked with because he we were we were based in Cambridge. We were based in in the MIT area, so a lot of the projects that we worked on were MIT based initiatives that were still on paper, but on paper at MIT. So on paper at MIT is a lot different than being on paper somewhere else. Yeah. Um, you know. So, a couple of projects worked, a couple of projects didn't. Uh, he ended up moving his operation to the West Coast. I ended up seeing the East Coast. Um, that's right. So, when you're dealing, and actually, I'm going to interrupt uh, real quick. There's more beer over there since the kegs are tapped, I guess. Circle right. yeah, Circle K doesn't sell craft beer. We, we got to get the important yeah, 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 absolutely. Get the beer done. <laughs> So when you're trying to secure capital for seed round, or you're working with those companies trying to get them to secure capital so early stage, what are the investors and, and companies that you're getting, or the individuals that are writing the checks, what are they looking for? What's the biggest red flag? What's the biggest thing they look for? Because I do know there's a few companies in here that have uh, seed rounds. Um, they're looking for even earlier. So I guess yeah. from an yeah. investment standpoint, what's the biggest red flag and what's the, uh, like, okay, I love this guy, we're gonna give him a shot. So, you, I mean, you, we, we had to, so my job was actually speaking and interviewing companies themselves as well as expanding the investment platform to talk to investors. So I was in on the conversation that we were, when we were vetting the companies into our fund, um, as well as the other side, which is essentially the capital. The, 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 the company, Vetting the company, I mean, we really look for not just for ideas, but for the people behind the ideas. How committed are they? Yeah. Um, what are they doing? What's their skin game in this? I mean, is this something that they just kind of came up with in a lab at MIT and they just wanted to sell this on napkin and walk away? Yeah. Or did they really want to develop this idea and be all in? And, you know, when I meet with people, with entrepreneurs at that time, that had this kind of idea and that we contemplated funding them, my first question is, are you willing to give up your life for this? Yeah. And that's, that was my first question. I you know, when I met with them. And they said, ah, I don't know. And I said, well, I'll say that. Um, have a good day. Have a good day. <laughs> yeah, well, let's get into that. Let's, why don't you tell, uh, tell us what you do with Mac and kind of what the vision is and what you and your brother and the rest of the family are doing. Yeah, we, uh, so it's a, it's a, it's a private equity real estate platform. We, we, we're owner operator of multifamily. Um, Residential units. So we, we buy apartment complexes, essentially, uh, and office, commercial office spaces. We uh, we buy them all over the southeast. We're southeastern focus, so mostly North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, Florida, uh, Texas. That's pretty much our core area. Our core area is really the Carolinas and, and, and Georgia. Uh, is what we concentrate on. Um, we have we pick up anything that's a hundred unit plus. When we talk about units being 100 apartment plus, yes. and we look for, you know, our, in our industry, what's known as value add. So we we look for something that's kind of a disconnect, that has some kind of a disconnect to the market, that's meaning either needing rehab or needing um, some kind of management play, um, 
there's got to be something that is uh, that, that is causing this particular asset to have a disconnect to the rest of its market peers. Meaning, if there's an apartment complex two blocks down the road that is charging thirty dollars in rent more, why is that apartment complex charging thirty dollars a box more in rent for that same exact one bedroom than this one? So. We, we love finding those because that's telling us there's some kind of a disconnect that we can hopefully fix, either by physical rehab or by human rehab. Yep. Meaning, get rid of the management and put on the management. Okay, so when you're doing something like that, I got a lot of questions because I don't know real estate or any of this shit. And I've told you that, we've yeah, had yeah, yeah. directs before. Sunday night at your house, I was like, I'm lost. I know tech, I don't know any of this. Um, so I guess the first thing, is if you're going to just wipe out, you're saying if you're going to wipe out a staff, you're going to find your own people, you're going to interview them, you're going to hire them to put them into the complex. Right, right. We we have so we have what's called a, a transition team, our company that their their sole job and purpose is to really go into an apartment that we're already <coughs> we're acquiring and uh, evaluate the team, the, the actual team that's 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 in place there. So you're interviewing them like, hey. You should exactly. keep your job alive. Exactly. Exactly. So you're the asshole who comes in. Pretty much. Okay. I mean, oh, we're, yeah. we're pretty much the asshole. <laughs> but, but again, it's another tenant would be in a, a, you know a, a, having having you know, your own responsibility in your own companies. If you're not willing to be the asshole, yeah, then you can't then, run a business. You can't run a business. Yep. Uh, so you have to be. You really have to be. Uh, we we would like sometimes to keep the the, the people in place and. and have continuity, but sometimes continuity is not good because sometimes the reason that that the, the asset is cheap is because there's bad management. So, uh, so yeah, there's so that team really is responsible for the turnaround of that particular assets from a human standpoint. Okay. And what's the price range that you guys usually the sweet spot? Do you have a sweet spot as far as we like to look at units cost over X amount but under X amount? Kind of what? How's that go? Yeah, I mean we we. We generally look for anything from about, let's say, you know, 10 million standpoint to 40 or 50. Million. That's that's there's no sweet spot. That's that's really the range. Um, 10 or 15 million, I would say maybe maybe 20 million would be a sweet spot. Acquisition would target. Yep. Um, 50 million would be on the higher end. Uh, that's 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 the range we're operating. We kind of have a hold of short hold, and our short hold is. Two years, three years. Okay. Um, two years considered a really short goal for us. Um, within two years, if we made our IR expectation and we, we hit our target uh, returns for our investors, then we sell out of the company. And, and you're still currently on your first fund with this? We, we are, so yeah, so we're, we're just launching our first funds now. Uh, actually, just the end of this month, hopefully, our first, first fund launches. Uh, before this fund, we've the way that we've done our acquisitions through in what's called individual syndication, uh, which means we would bring a project onto market and say, "This is a here's the here's the project. It's actual it would be an actual asset, so you know, an apartment complex. So let's say even this building. Say we're, we're buying an HQ building. Um, here's the expected returns. Here are the expected cash on cash. Um, who's in yeah. essentially? And we we go to our statement of investors and see if we would like to be in." And then we would obviously close on the on the on the, on the sale. Uh, well, the fund is is a little bit different. It works similar to how most funds work. Essentially, it's a it's still discretionary capital, meaning the investors in the fund will not have you know day to day say so on what, what's you know, what, what's going on or what we're acquiring. But what they will get is that they'll get um, the benefit of aggregated purchases or aggregated assets. So the fund will. Let's say 20 apartment buildings, um, as opposed to just buying into one apartment building, what we did before, an individual acquisition. So it's funny, uh, my wife and I were sitting in the back, we were talking to Dan Roselli, who owns this building that we're sitting in, and he asked who was speaking. This was like 5 30. And I told him and I told him what you did, and he said that this is the hardest market to be in. 
And he said that buying the HQ, although he loves it, it's one of the hardest, most stressful things. He thought it was going to be easy. So what's the secret sauce to, to do it? Because, I mean, he's had a lot of ups and downs. And we have Kevin here. I don't know where you are, Kevin. But there you are. From, uh, he owns Advent Coworking, another co-working space. So what's the secret sauce when you're looking to, I guess more so from a commercial property, when you're looking to acquire, um, What's the best way to get your return on investment? Yeah, co co-working space is, is tough, uh, and it's and it's a and it's a definitely a hot market. I mean, it's a hot market in Boston, it's a hot market in New York. Um, I, I looked into a couple of different co-working um, assets that, that, that a couple of, about a year and a half ago, two years ago. Um, it's a hot market. It's a very hot market. It's continuing to be a hot market, but uh, uh, it's it's more difficult from from the operator standpoint if you buy it and operate an asset than it is from an acquisition standpoint, for, which means for us. I mean, the stress that we have on, on our side of the business is who is the operator that's occupying our assets, our buildings? If it's a commercial office space, you know, obviously the more stable that occupant is, the better for us. Yeah. Um, but do we wake up stressing every, every day whether how good his business is doing? No, I mean, I'll be, I hate to sound heartless, but all we care about is whether he's gonna be able to pay his rent or not. Yeah. So, um, it's it's but that's still stressful. I mean, because if, if a lot of a lot of a lot of times, if, if if you have a commercial office space and you have a let's call it an anchor tenant that's occupying fifty percent of your property or sixty percent of your property, or sometimes more, if that company folds or something happens to them, you screw. Yeah. I mean, this is it's and it's it's not easy to replace. So that's really the stress for us. It's, it's, if we lose something like that. Uh, it's not like renting an apartment. You can't just flip it out in, in, in a week. Have a waiting list. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, especially with a larger building. I mean, the larger the building is, the more stressful it is because you, know, you can't find someone every day that's going to rent 100,000 square feet. That's that, you know, or 50,000 square feet. I mean, that's 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 an enormous company. You have to really go through. So I could, you know, the stress in our business is from that standpoint, not from the day-to-day -day operation of, you know, whether. Hey, did I bring in enough revenue into my building, such as HQ or, yeah. you know, or anything like that? So it's a different stress, but it is nonetheless still stressful. So you mentioned you're focusing on the Carolinas, Georgia, a little bit of Texas. Where's the hot market right now, or even if it's closer to Charlotte? Like, what's what do you see as being the next banging spot um, as far as growth? Well, the hot market now is is, is besides Gaston. Yeah, besides Gaston. Yeah. Besides, besides, yeah. <laughs> That's what you just did. <laughs> <laughs> it's 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 Rale Raleigh's is, is is flaming hot right now. I mean, it's we can't we can't ourselves touch anything in Raleigh just because the numbers don't work. Not because right. we look at we we want to buy in Raleigh more, but, but we just uh, we look at the numbers and it's just uh, they're just out of whack. Uh, the numbers are everywhere right now are out of whack. I mean, we are at a cycle, unfortunately, where. We, we believe we're at the top of the cycle. Uh, we don't know what the top looks like. Uh, it's, not a, it's not an angled curve where, it's, where the curve is like that. It's, it's more of a flat top curve where we are, we know we're somewhere closer to the top, but we just don't know how that flat part, how long the flat part is gonna go. Um, the flat part could go for another 18 months, 24 months. 36 months, uh, we really don't know. It, it, a lot of it is uh, going to be dependent on what the uh, migration from the apartment renters is going to be to single family homes. Uh, we, we, those, those logistics really affect our business, obviously. Uh, the, the interest rates affect our business to some extent, the, the, the Fed interest rate, uh, because that determines what the mortgage rates are going to be. Mortgage rates, in turn, somewhat affect our business. Ironically, in the past couple of years, the mortgage rates have been really low, but apartment occupancy has been really high. So, I, you know, it's, you know, we look at sometimes our business and go, what the Does that fuck? Up? Yeah, <laughs> doesn't that up? Like, it's, it's, you should be able, historically, you should be able to afford a home pretty easily from a mortgage standpoint. Um, yet we find a lot of, in our business, we find a lot of, especially younger like millennials, really not gravitating yet towards home ownership. They're gravitating more towards a, uh, more nomadic, I always call it, it nomadic lifestyle where they're renting apartments and changing cities and, and that's probably wrong. Where they don't want to be tethered to a home that they have to own and operate or things like that. So that's that's a fair point. But that's really the only explanation I have. Uh, because all on, on, on paper, 
you know, from a financial standpoint, it makes more sense now to buy a home than ever. But, uh, but hey, I'm not complaining because yeah. we're, you know, we're getting the benefit of more, more, more renters. Uh, but that cycle is at some point it will will end, and um, and then that's when you see some you know some changes in, in the industry. Uh, so I'm assuming if there's another crash like an 07, 08 for the housing market, that's going to make it harder for you to get these apartments just because a lot of people, more foreclosures, more apartments rented out, more revenues for that. Yeah, so I don't think it's, I, th I don't think we're going to go, even when the market adjusts and we have a, a, a recapitalization in the market, I don't think, I don't think we're going to go through what we went through in 2008. Um, liquidity is a lot higher now than it was in 2008. Uh, banks are a lot more cautious than they were in 2008, even though there's still some questionable lending going on. But um, it, 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 the dynamics in the marketplace in general are not the same as 2008. So when we have a, a correction or an adjustment in the market, I, I would be hesitant to say it's going to be a crash. Uh, it might be a, a soft slope down as opposed to a crash. Um, but that could be good or bad for us. I mean, it could be good for us from a buyer standpoint because you'd want to buy during a downturn to some extent. Right now, it's a seller's market. Right now, everybody that owns similar assets that we do is you know, on high ground. They, yeah, that, and that's why the numbers don't make sense to us because when we look at financials and we spreadsheet a, a, an asset, we go, where are the, where are the profits? I mean, where, where, how can we make the income that we want to make to our investors by buying the asset. It just doesn't make sense. Um, so doing a downturn, that will, the numbers will start obviously being more deleterious to the sellers. They'll be more beneficial for us. So, uh, you want to talk about peak? Peak? Um, no. Okay. <laughs> That's for next time. That's for next time. All right. Yeah. So, uh, you've done some other investing, or I'm sorry, so you had a capstone as well. Yeah. Why do you explain the Capstone? Well, Capstone is our, is our sister company. Capstone is our, um, uh, essentially, we, 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 I said we're owner operators, so Capstone is our, essentially, operating arm for running all of our assets. Um, Mac Venture Partners is essentially the capital arm and the acquisition arm and the, the money arm of the whole enterprise. Uh, Capstone is essentially the the day-to-day the -day operation of, of the apartments. They're the one who fire people. Okay. In, in <laughs> <laughs> so that way your name doesn't have to be as I'm with Matt. Yeah, exactly. I don't know what you're talking about. I'm sorry that happened to you. No, that, that's that team over there. Yeah, exactly. So do you do uh, any angel investing or anything? Have you, have you considered that? Uh, as far as more tech outside of? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I personally did before and it didn't work out so well, but I, you know, I, uh, we, would, we would certainly probably entertain it in the next couple of years, hopefully after we grow. Fund one, maybe fund two. We can probably look at doing something that outside of the scope of what we what we currently do. So you said it didn't go well. What did you learn from that? Because you said that there's no mistakes ever made. So oh, there, there's, there's, well, well there are mistakes. Mistakes, but they're learning. Experiences. Oh, they're, they're learning experiences. Oh, yeah. absolutely, absolutely. Um, I think it's because at, for that particular situation, I invested because it was a friend. Oh, uh, and. Uh, don't invest in friends. I they call them PDFs, friends, yeah. family, and fools. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, that's why for, for us in, in, in our business, we really a lot of what we when we go to market, we really rely on investors outside of you know. There's no such thing as friends and family investors for us because we just don't want to put anybody in an awkward situation. Yep. Um, even though our investment is is a lot safer than a lot of other investments out there. Uh, I mean, I. I love going head to head with someone who's comparing us to you know, an, an equity or Wall Street investment. Um, I came from, from Wall Street in my background, so I, I love to talk about that. Um, you know, I love to talk about beta and alpha because that's what they you know, people who are always in, who are heavily invested in, in equity and, and debt from a from a from a Wall Street perspective, they love to talk about that. So I can I can go head to head with them any day because our beta or our risk is so much less than, than anything out there as far as stocks or, or even bonds. Um, so I, I, I can always hands down sell, sell over anybody who's, uh, who's trying to compare us to you know, stocks and bonds. Yeah, and you're talking stocks or bonds, and I mean, that's not even on the level of tech investing. Right. I, I mean, 90 out of 100 failed, 95 out of 100 investments, so. Yeah. Um, 
you, you talked about that, that entrepreneurial pressure crunch, and, and I kind of agree. That there's almost that rush of approaching a deadline, knowing in your heart that you're going to hit it anyway. But as a leader, and with clients, with team members, with people relying on you, how have you adapted for yourself to try to change your behavior so it's not always just at deadline time you're getting it done? You know, I mean, you gotta delegate, you gotta, you gotta let go. Um, it's something that um, I think my brother knows a lot more about. He used to be a control freak a lot more than, than I was. And, uh, you know, he, he had to, I think he will attest to that. Our, our business really grew when we started letting go of responsibilities and not being, and trusting the team. I mean, you have to, you, you let go and you trust everybody else to work with it. Because if you don't trust them, then you don't even hire them. I mean, or don't even work with them. There's no, there's no sense in doing that. I mean, if, if, if you're not hiring someone or bringing someone on your team that if after a certain time you look at it and say, you know what, I can walk away and trust that they're going to do what my vision is or what you know the vision of the company is, then it just don't make it because that's 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 yeah, okay. it's just a waste of huge waste of time. Um, I think once you have that, if you, if you have the right team in place and you have the right execution in place and everybody's working towards the same vision, then then you can probably relax and kind of pull back. Excellent. What's his most embarrassing story in all this kid? <laughs> He's even got videos. That's like VHS like videos. You're just drinking too slow. I know. I know. Uh, I know this is kind of like a big issue right now going on in Charlotte. Like, what are your thoughts on gentrification? Do you think you know you guys should be taking care of it or helping the people get reestablished in other places, or do you think the government should be taking care of it, or do you try to work with your you know the current tenants whenever you take over? How's that go? As far as relocating, what? I'm sorry. Like um, you know, you come in and you you know you, you were talking about earlier how the rent was cheap because management was not so great. Right. Know, like, right. So if you come in and up the rent, you know, do you work with your tenants to, you know, try to work around that? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, it's we do. Uh, and you've got to look at the tenant profile when we first go into a building. We're not raising, we don't raise rents in, in the areas that we go into where it's untenable to, for the tenant because you're shooting yourself in the foot. I mean, right. your tenant are essentially your clients in, in, in a really in large respect to your clients. That's, that's who we cater to. That's how we, that's how we, that's how we really succeed. I mean, if our tenants are delighted, then we're making, you know, then we're making great strides. Um, so, yeah, I mean, to, to a large extent, you can't win them all, though. I mean, you can't, if you increase rent by 30, 30 bucks a month and somebody can't afford it, sometimes we try to work with them. Um, we we do have other sister properties. Sometimes we go, we say, if you can't afford to be here, then we have, other sister properties that we can maybe relocate you to. Um, some of our uh, uh, managers try to work with them on maybe getting kind of federal subsidies if they need that. But uh, that's you know beyond that. I mean, at, at some point, they, if it's completely untenable, whether it's through relocating to other sister properties or um, getting federal subsidies or something like that, then uh, yeah, that's pretty much where we can't get more than that. Uh, I'm a current student at UNC Charlotte, so I was wondering what were some of your best moves, some of your worst moves in your college years at UNC Charlotte? Best moves? Wow, that's one of the worst moves. Which moves on girls, sir? <laughs> 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 Sorry, that's your girl. Right. <laughs> <laughs> moves. <laughs> moves. A lot of smooth moves. I know. Mean, <laughs> uh, gosh. I, I probably had a lot more bad moves when I was a like, young yeah, than I did have a few moves. <laughs> I, and again, my brother will attest, attest to, to him getting calls in the middle of the night. We, um, we had the, the TV too for the videos. So <laughs> I think pop those up. Uh, gosh, I, 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 think, I, I, I think probably the good moves are picking subjects that I really were Pat was passionate about. College. Um, as corny as that sound, you really have to. You learn so much more when you're passionate about something that you're, that you're learning about. <laughs> uh, those are my, my, my good moves. My, my bad moves are probably getting 
given up to easy on the class that I probably should have stuck to more. Uh, and I paid for it now. He's doing my master's. And, um, and I got an idea. I was like, shit, I should pay more attention to the counter. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so that, that, yeah, that's probably it. Drinking public. We just talk to you about it quicker. Oh, yes. <laughs> Lots of drinking. Cheers to that. Cheers! <laughs> You're only limited to one question, so I'm... One more, so... Now go on. Uh, just one word on, on passion. I feel like... You know, passion starts from when you're a kid. So I had a curiosity switching gears a good bit here. What was your first paying job? And what was it? My first so paying when, job? When was it and what was it? Yeah, yeah, my first paying job I was uh, 13, 14. Um, my father got me a job as carpet. Uh, I was making, you know, manufacturing cabinets and, and you know, stuff like that. So I, my job was to sweep this shop floor and uh, make sure the nails are picked up and go, go with him on jobs to make sure that he's got his hammer prints. I mean, they really, literally an old-fashioned carpenter. Um, my second job from that was working with an AC guy. Again, my father got me, got me a job with a <laughs> guy who fixed, uh, you know, an HVAC equipment. So, That's where I focus. I know how hard that shit is. Yeah, that, 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 that shit was brand man. <laughs> And that, that was, that's my second job. And it's, you know, as far as learning from them, I mean, I, look, you, you learn from every job. It's, uh, I think my father's aim from getting me those jobs, as meals as, 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 as they were, as just probably the you know, the value of work, working things, showing up. Um, I had to, you know, I had to be in the carpenter shop, crack at dawn sometime. Uh, and, and then at 13 or 14, we lived where I grew up in Syria. I grew up in Aleppo, Syria. And uh, yeah, I, thinking back at it now, I, with my own son, I don't know if I ever trust him at 13 to venture out at 5 o'clock, 6 o'clock in the morning to, to go somewhere uh, in a big city. I mean, yeah, this, is, this was not a small city. No, I, I, I would probably would definitely, if I was to change anything, and I'm not one of the regret, I don't have regret, I just, I just, I don't believe in regret, I think regret is a waste of time. But uh, if I was to change anything, it would be probably working less in corporate America and more on, on, on entrepreneurship. Do you feel like they're just kind of going off that? Do you feel like there's some key skills that you like really need to learn? Oh, the absolute from that is. corporate America, and then you'd be like, hey, once I got these things, like I'm good to go. I'm ready for the next step. Yeah, absolutely. There, there's a there's a certain point that you get in your career if you're working in corporate America that there's a there's a point of diminishing returns where. You have to, it depends on what you're going for and what kind of skill set you're going for, but there's a point of diminishing return media at some point, whatever you're learning is not bringing you any more benefit. Mm -hmm. So the benefits are actually receding rather than exceeding what you're, what, what you're doing. So um, when you get to that point, that's when you know you need to get out right? and, and, and do something else. And, uh, and, and all of us will feel it at different times in our lives. Um, for me, it was probably three or four years earlier than I should have. I felt it probably three or four years earlier than I, than I should have acted on. Um, it almost sounds like it's the same as being the smartest person in the room kind of thing. Like you're not learning anything anymore. Yeah, yeah. I mean, when you get to a point where you sit across the table from someone and you think, how the hell did they get there? <laughs> <laughs> Do you think hardship develops scrappiness and grit, and sometimes calm? Do you think that gives an entrepreneur an advantage over someone who may have been mean? Yeah, yeah, for sure. For sure. I think anybody, like Jeff, will attest that, that, that hardship definitely builds something. Uh, and, and, and grit is definitely a I find that you use the word grit. Um, I think that, that that gets built over the course of experiencing both hardship and success. You have to have hardship and failure in order to really experience what success is. Um, failure is a huge kind of pet project of mine. I love the study of failure. Um, I'm fascinated by failure. Um, to me, I like 
I, I, to me, failure, knowing failure, and studying failure, and, and, and kind of, um, I don't want to say reveling in failure, but really that's the, that's the ground zero of success. Because if you, if you don't know how to fail, if you don't know what failing looks like, sounds like, tastes like, feels like, you're, you're really not going to enjoy your success. You're not going to know what success is. So, I don't know if that, that helps. I you mentioned the deals that you were making your company from 10, 40, or 50 million dollars. I was wondering what negotiation and strategies have you used and what insights have you learned in terms of what works and what doesn't? Um, you, you have to be able to walk away from, from any deal. Uh, no matter how much you like it, uh, no matter how much you think that it's the best thing to slice bread, uh, you, have to, you have to be able to walk away from, from almost any deal uh, if, if it doesn't make sense to you. There's gotta, and then you've got to draw the line and you got to stick to that line, obviously. Because um, if, you, if you say, I'm going to walk away if it's less than this, and, you, and it's less than that, and you're still, still going to walk away, then you're not, you're not doing yourself any favors. Uh, it, it, it's, it's the same as being an actor with any project. If you're, it, again, it, it, we were talking about when I was a party standing, the guy who was in commercial fishing, one of his, one of his earlier, earlier, my first mentor, his earlier advice to me was, Never be enamored with the stock. Never be so in love with the stock that you can't sell it for yourself or for your clients. That's exactly how I was selling stocks. Um, same thing working with, with oh, really a lot of things, especially projects. Never be so in love with a project and so enamored and so obsessed with it that you just forget all reason, both financial and personal reasons. Um, you have to you have to know when to walk away. Um, and that, it's hard. Being an entrepreneur to know that, especially if it's your idea. Um, but listen, you always can live to fight another day. You know, but you can you can't fight the same fight for something that's that's going to lose you over and over and over again. Uh, so it's the same with our projects. That's, we have to we have to we have to be able to, to you know after we do our assessments and we do our financial analysis, we have to have a point where we say, okay, beyond this. It really doesn't make sense physically, financially. It doesn't make sense for us to buy this market. And we have to go to the market. Uh, so I was just curious, John. So uh, you mentioned you're about to raise your first fund. Uh, you also said that you, uh, you believe we're close to the top of the cycle. Why, why is it planned that way? Uh, you're always at the top of some cycle. So it's it's you know we either we either the top or the bottom or it, 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 markets are always moving. So um, it's not it's not timing the market per se as your time in the market a lot of times. So um, if, if we start the fund right now, which is what we're doing this month, um, our fund is going to be buying mostly opportunities that are going to be held for the next five to seven years in, inside that fund. If we are able to capture the right opportunities, meaning again goes going back to having the right financials, right, the, the, the right structure that we want for each deal, um, then it, it, the markets are not going to matter for us. I mean, there's going to be, yeah, would we, would we, would we maybe take a, the markets, if, if the markets take a 10 to 15% hit in the next two or three years, would it matter for us? Yeah, of course it'll, it'll matter for us, but that's the thing with apartment investing is we're buying something somewhat for a longer, medium hold, uh, five to seven year hold, that uh, if the financials are, are working right, then it's, it's, it's look, they're, you're, they're always gonna, you're always gonna have renters. That's, that's, a, that's a fact, no matter, no matter how many houses are, 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 are being bought, you're always going to have renters. You're always going to have uh, demographics of people that are moving from jobs to, uh, to, to different jobs, and, and these people are going to need places to rent. So uh, we wholeheartedly believe in the apartment. Building. 